they did it again, guys. Starship just pulled off another successful flight. And honestly, this might be the most successful one yet this year. But just because it didn't explode doesn't mean it was boring. Far from it. There were a bunch of hidden details and new tests packed into this mission that are seriously worth talking about. So, here's everything that went down during Starship Flight 11. Propellant loading went smoothly today. No issues there. But man, check out that exhaust plume blasting through Max-Q. That's the point when Starship is under the most mechanical stress during ascent, and it's just such a wild sight. Every time I see this thing fly, I'm reminded of what an absolute beast it is. If you're new to all this, it's hard to grasp just how massive Starship really is. Without people nearby for scale, it barely looks real. Just the first stage booster, the part we're watching here, is over 70 meters tall, or about 230 feet, and the tank section is 9 meters 30 feet wide. Stack Starship on top, and the whole thing reaches 120 meters, nearly 400 feet tall. It's a skyscraper that flies. As the rocket climbed, one of the engines did cut out, but otherwise the flight was pretty much flawless. Interestingly, this has happened in at least two or three past flights as well. It's not a huge issue, the vehicle is designed to handle it, but if SpaceX digs into the root cause, they might be able to make the system even more reliable. Then came the always awesome hot staging sequence. That's the moment when Super Heavy shuts down all but three of its center engines and Starship's six Raptors ignite while still attached to push the stages apart. The separation looked super clean again, really smooth. Since Flight 9, SpaceX has made some tweaks, like blocking off certain vents on the hot stage ring so that the exhaust helps rotate the booster in a specific direction. In earlier flights, that flip maneuver wasn't very controlled, so it's cool to see more precision creeping in. It'll be interesting to see how they handle that flip when they move to fully integrated hot staging with the upgraded V3 boosters. But back to this flight, the boost back burn looked great, smooth as ever. And then SpaceX pulled off something totally new with the booster, a new phase in the landing sequence. It started with 13 engines firing for the initial landing burn, then transition to five engines for the divert phase. That's basically where the booster fine-tunes its trajectory. And this setup adds redundancy in case any engines cut out unexpectedly. Everything seemed to go well. The booster came down nice and steady, then switched to three center engines, and finally just two as it hovered for a few seconds before splashing down. This time, they didn't bother trying to catch or recover the booster, and that's totally intentional. SpaceX already knows how to recover these things, and this particular hardware is being retired soon anyway. They're moving on to the new V3 design, so there's really no point in salvaging something that's going to be obsolete. Better to let it sink safely than risk it washing up on a foreign beach and causing another international headache. As always, the real star of the show here is the Starship Upper Stage. Besides Ship 37, every Starship flight this year has had major issues, either during ascent or engine shutdown. One even blew up on the pad. So hearing a mission controller call out nominal orbit insertion was a chef's kiss. It means the six Raptor engines did exactly what they were supposed to during a six-minute burn, and everything went according to plan. After that came another cool moment, satellite deployment, or rather a demo version of it. Starship deployed a batch of Starlink satellite simulators. Think of them as non-functioning dummies designed to test the deployment mechanism. And yep, we finally got an external camera view of the satellites being released. The footage wasn't the best quality, but hey, we'll take what we can get. Compared to the last attempt, when one of the dummy sats bounced off the payload door, this time was much smoother. None of these simulators will stay in orbit. Starship's on a suborbital path for this mission, so they'll fall back to Earth. Still, a very slick tech demo. Earlier in the webcast, one of the SpaceX hosts mentioned that once Starship is operational, it'll be able to launch batches of about 60 full-size Starlink V3 satellites. That's around 60 terabits per second of added network capacity per launch, about 20 times more than what a Falcon 9 can do. That's just wild. 
Eventually, SpaceX wants Starship to fully take over satellite launches from Falcon 9. And while Falcon 9 is smaller and currently cheaper, Starship is designed to be more efficient and have a lower cost per kilogram to orbit. That's the long game. After the dummy satellites were deployed, the next big test was the Raptor Relight. And while it may not sound like a big deal, restarting an engine in space, in vacuum, when it's cold, is a huge milestone. Starship needs to be able to do that reliably if it's ever going to complete a full orbital mission and return safely. Because without that engine relight, there's no way to slow down for re-entry, and you've just got a big steel can orbiting Earth until gravity decides it's time to bring it back. By the time re-entry started, the Starlink simulators were already well out of the way. Everything had been going so well, and next up was re-entry. We started to see plasma building up, and it really showed how extreme re-entry is, and at the same time, just how beautiful it can be. In previous flights, SpaceX had removed a good number of tiles from the heat shield in various locations to stress test less vulnerable areas during re-entry. There were still some tiles removed this time too, but I believe it was much less than before. They just wanted to show what this version of Starship can really do especially now that it's no longer exploding mid-air like it was earlier this year. Also worth noting, they didn't test the metallic tiles again. Those were a big reason the ship turned orange during the last flight. But that didn't make re-entry any less exciting. SpaceX's Dan Hewitt even warned, do not be surprised if this is not a very smooth flight on the way down. Even though fewer heat shield tiles were removed, the ones that were missing were located in more vulnerable parts of the spacecraft. The idea here is to pinpoint exactly how and where the vehicle might fail, or maybe even see if Starship is more robust than expected. As the ship came down, it performed a dynamic banking maneuver, basically an aggressive final turn that, in the future, will line it up directly behind the launch tower for landing. As it dropped below the clouds, Starship had slowed to just over 300 kilometers per hour. Then, Mission Control called out, Landing burn startup. The three center Raptor engines roared to life, swinging the vehicle's base around to reorient it vertically. In a controlled descent, Starship began lowering itself toward the ocean. In the final moments, SpaceX switched to a buoy-mounted camera, capturing the dramatic splashdown, followed immediately by a large explosion. Background cheers broke out, followed by a clear breath of relief from As the mission commentators. Everyone. This marks only the second time SpaceX has reached such a milestone with version 2, the updated series of Starship prototypes introduced earlier this year. Version 2 Starships failed mid-flight on three different missions in 2025. It wasn't until the last test flight in August that one managed a clean landing. Cracking the challenge of getting Starship safely back through Earth's atmosphere, intact and with communications still online, is a big deal. SpaceX's long-term goal is to land the vehicle smoothly so it can be reused again and again. There are a few fun little details about the Starship hardware from this flight that are worth pointing out. The booster used was Booster 15, which also flew on Flight 8, now making its second appearance. It launched with 24 flight-proven Raptor engines, which is impressive in itself. On top of that sat Ship 38, the very last of the Version 2 Starships, and it came with quite a few updates. For starters, the Starling terminals were repositioned, and there were noticeable changes to the catch pin design, which will eventually play a key role in tower catch attempts. Internally, some of the weld structures were updated, and most interestingly, the ship now includes docking ports for future orbital refueling tests, a major step toward making long-duration space missions possible. The heat shield layout also got a refresh, with a new tapered tile edge design running across the whole vehicle. Unlike earlier ships, this one didn't have traditional lift points. It relied entirely on catch pins and stabilizer points. And finally, it was equipped with new RCV roll control thrusters, giving it more control authority during flight. That said, the next Starship flight is going to be a whole different story. It'll be the debut of Starship Block 3, a version packed with a ton of new upgrades. Overall, Flight 11 was a huge success, even more so than the last one. Everything from the launch, altitude climb, and max Q, the moment of maximum aerodynamic pressure, went smoothly. Hot staging worked exactly as planned, and after separation, the first stage pulled off a turn maneuver to line itself up for a landing in the Gulf. It hit the target zone perfectly, and then, as expected, exploded on impact. Meanwhile, the second stage really solidified the progress made during the previous flight. 
Ship 38 checked off every major milestone. It reached a suborbital trajectory, deployed eight full-scale Starlink mock-ups, successfully restarted a Raptor engine in space, and, most importantly, re-entered Earth's atmosphere and splashed down in the Indian Ocean. Now, Starship has had its fair share of problems, especially with the second stage. But thanks to SpaceX's rapid, iterative development approach, issues have been tackled and fixed one by one. And the results speak for themselves. After three failed flights earlier this year, the team made the necessary changes and pulled off two successful missions in a row. What's really great about these final Block 2 missions is that SpaceX is free to push boundaries and test different systems with each flight. That's the whole point. It's not just about building a working rocket. They're trying to create a fully reusable launch system and design it in a way that supports mass production. The focus isn't just on whether each individual launch succeeds or fails. It's about learning, refining, and scaling fast. That's why Starship flights make headlines so often. SpaceX doesn't mind breaking things to figure out what works. But even with that mindset, it's incredibly satisfying to see real progress. They've had plenty of challenges this year, but they keep pushing through. And honestly, what they've achieved is nothing short of incredible. Well done, SpaceX. After the flight, acting NASA Administrator Sean Duffy called today's test another major step toward landing Americans on the moon's South Pole. He praised the progress SpaceX showed with this Starship mission, saying it's a crucial part of getting NASA's Artemis program where it needs to be. As we prepare for Artemis 2, every successful flight brings us closer to Artemis 3 and to beating China back to the moon, Duffy wrote. His comments come at a time when there's growing skepticism about whether Starship will be ready in time for NASA's planned moon landing in 2027. Since stepping into the NASA role in July, while also serving as Secretary of Transportation under Trump, Duffy has been one of the most vocal figures pushing the message that the U.S. needs to stay ahead in what's shaping up to be a new space race with China.